you're already here. <laughs> I, I have a room problem. I have a room problem with this platform uh, because they keep closing one of the other sessions. And I'm talking to like a room of like five people going, wow, they really dropped off, you know? Uh, oh, and uh, yeah, so here we are. Awkward. They want you at all the ribs. Hey. You want me at all the ribs. <laughs> uh, it is really good to connect with you again. I'm super excited yeah. about this. I'm Absolutely. Hoping that, uh, hoping that the light doesn't actually create like a, like a feedback loop between our two, uh, our two domes. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've left a good millimeter uh, stubble because I had a unplanned visit with the uh, heavy beams in my attic. Uh, so, oh gosh, so no, no shaving uh, for on, on top for a couple <laughs> of uh, couple of weeks. But um, hey, so I'm guessing that the vast majority of our users are way more uh, familiar with who you are. So I don't even know if an introduction is needed that much. The plan for this last session is a fireside chat. So uh, I get the extremely envious role of being able to actually ask you questions about GraphQL and uh, Pleasure's mine. <laughs> and we'll talk about it uh, back and forth. And uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun for the community. Please uh, just, if you have any questions that come up, just pop them in that chat. We're totally happy to take them and, uh, or I'm happy to see them, filter them and pass them on. Uh, you know, you don't want to hear my thoughts on GraphQL. Uh, that's not, that's not why you're here. So um Let's let's get this uh, get this started. So, or should I give you an intro? I mean, maybe maybe I just maybe you give yourself a quick five minute intro in case anybody doesn't happen to know who you are uh, in the GraphQL track. Um, oh sure. So I'm Jeff Schmidt. I'm the, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Apollo GraphQL. So we make the widely used open source libraries Apollo Client and Apollo Server, as well as uh, we help some of the uh, larger GraphQL users scale GraphQL in the enterprise and ask, hey, you know, when we had one team using GraphQL, that was one thing. Now I have a whole bunch of teams using GraphQL. How do we take that from, you know, just something that we're using to solve maybe particular problems in product development to a larger strategy? So it's been amazing seeing the community grow over the last couple of years. I think first Apollo client release was in early 2016, I think. Um, and I, I guess also by way of background, before that, uh, we're the team that built Meteor JS. So a lot of our interest and excitement about GraphQL came from what we'd seen in the Meteor community as people were building more and more sophisticated applications and trying to deploy that in the enterprise. So it's been a really crazy journey, really exciting journey um, from 2016 today, I think for the whole GraphQL community. And we are just like so excited, so proud, so energized when we see all the things that people are doing with GraphQL and how it's changing people's um, workflows and development practices and you know product strategies. So. Really excited to be here and just kind of another chance to connect with the community and see how we can be helpful. Very cool. I'm just uh, noticing that the indic the indicator light of the talk being recorded is not actually lit. So I have notified uh, the, the mods uh, to see if they can quickly hop on that. I guess while waiting for that, um, I am going to quickly intro myself, I guess, on uh, that case, because I didn't really ever do that at the beginning of the track today, uh, just to give, kill a little bit of space, because we want to get this thing recorded, because I think it's going to be good. Um, so those of you that don't know who I am, uh, Jesse Martin, so I'm a, I do DevRel for GraphCMS, a GraphQL-only headless CMS uh, that works in, in the space. Um, I have often joked in the past in my talks that I feel like I'm repping Apollo, because in all of my little demos and tutorials that I do, it comes up a ridiculous amount <laughs> of the, just throw this into uh, Apollo and do this in Apollo and with Apollo. So uh, that's a pretty, it's a pretty good tool. Um, yeah. So we, we have free developer accounts. I definitely recommend anybody to who wants to get into GraphQL quickly, rapidly iterate on schema design, um, check us out and we play really well with all the different tools and frameworks out there. I'm still not seeing the recording light coming on here, so we may have to just kind of call it good, or I may just uh, throw up a recorder <laughs> of my own. Uh, so let me see if we can get get this last uh, minute. Uh, Hannah, if you're if you're watching this, are you able to check into what's happening there? 
Anna is my my guardian angel in this chat today. She's located people and helped me find the right room. Okay, I see so Scott she's pointing out in chat. Yeah, good. Someone is recording. It's going. All right. Okay. So, awesome. Off to secret the recorders. Time. Very good. Let's get this started. So uh, as roughly touched on, and I promised you that I wouldn't ask you too many controversial questions, but we've got to like, I mean, edges, edges are fun. So like we both like GraphQL. We both work in companies that essentially for, for the better, I think, um, have bought in 100%. So we, our companies will live and die based on GraphQL. So we really believe it. We've bought into it. From your experience, because you've worked with a lot of different companies in the space now, from Expedia to, I mean, well, you could name a huge list <laughs> of, of massive companies, with, uh, popular names that are using GraphQL. From your experience and, and the way you see GraphQL being adopted, do you see it replacing REST? And then I'm just going to drop it right there. Sure. Answer. You said not a controversial question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of feel like you set me up here. No, um, I think it's a super interesting question. It's kind of a nuanced question. I think that, um, you know, if we think about the evolution of APIs over time, I think there was a whole like world or realm or time period where we thought about APIs in a point to point way. And REST is one example of that point to point paradigm for APIs, you know, REST, SOAP, I mean, even going into like gRPC, Thrift, like these are all sort of APIs modeled on the idea of a remote procedure call, a call and a response situation. And I think what we're seeing is the emergence of another paradigm for APIs. So let me maybe kind of sketch out what I see that as, and then maybe we can go into where would this be useful? Because I don't think it's ever the case that one technology completely replaces another. We add new things that have new uses, and we ask where can we apply this, where can we get value from it? So I think the, you know, GraphQL is an example of a different way of thinking about APIs that's a many-to-many -many approach to APIs instead of a point-to-point -point approach. So let me zoom out and, and say what I, you know, talk about what I mean by that. I think that the, if you look at the way a lot of people use REST APIs, especially for product development, is in every screen in your app, it used to be, it used to be the way we built apps is we had a web server, it spit out HTML and CSS. Now people want much more richer, more interactive experiences. And so we build these, not just websites, but apps, whether they're in you know, Swift or whether they're in JavaScript. The whole point is there's code running on the client and now every app has an API inside of it. So that's what's driven some of the questions about you know, when we have that model where APIs are really ubiquitous, not just for like backend business to business communications, but like every single page in your app, I'm making intensive use of APIs. When we use APIs so much, like what do we need to change about how we approach APIs um, in that environment? And they're very demanding applications because often you have many different data sources in the cloud, not just one. And often you don't just have one front end, you maybe have many front ends, not just web, iOS and Android, but maybe IoT, maybe partners, you know, whatever your platform strategy is. We've got a lot of data coming from a lot of places. There's a lot of places that needs to go. And how we move that data around is also really important. Um, you know, privacy is important, security is important, data residency is important. Performance is important. So we've got this very demanding use case. Now in that environment, if you think about the way a point-to-point -point API technology like REST plays out, it's almost like, you know, if you and I want to talk, it's like we dig a ditch in the ground and we bury a cable, and now you and I can have a conversation. And that, that ditch and that cable is the, is the REST endpoint. Like we have to write code on the server, we have to write code on the client to manage moving a set of data down to the client to power a particular screen in an app. Any given screen in an app is a join fundamental, data from different places. And I think the idea of GraphQL is fundamentally, what does it look like if we give people not a buried cable, but a dial tone? A situation where I've got a phone book, I've got a map of all my data in the cloud, I can dial for anything I need. Or maybe a better analogy would be, it's like Amazon Prime for digital assets. So you can put any combination of things in your shopping cart. So I think what's driving is the need for a more flexible way to combine those different data sources in the cloud and push them into a lot of different channels where the requirements we might have tomorrow might be like very different from the requirements we have today. And we don't want to write a bunch of endpoints every time we make that change. And so, sorry, it's a little bit of monologue, but let me just go one other thing out there that I think is kind of a good map for this. Um, what, what makes GraphQL, or I might broadly say the data graph idea, the idea we're gonna have a schema and we're gonna query the schema, whether it's GraphQL or you know, some other technology you might come up with, what makes that valuable? I think it's really three things in this new paradigm of many-to-many -many APIs. Um, it's the idea of being agile, abstract, and declarative. So by agile, I mean 
sometimes, and people use REST APIs all kinds of different ways. So I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with the situation where we say, hey, we're releasing a new version of our API. We might do that, what, every year, every two years? You know, if we're going to change, <laughs> if we're going to change the endpoint, we, I don't know, mail, email a mailing list to ask who's using that endpoint. We hope the person who's using it isn't on vacation. Um, the data graph in GraphQL is about a more agile approach to APIs where we might change our API multiple times a day. We might have 20 backend teams, all of whom are changing their schema multiple times a day. So if there's so much data that's going so many places, how do we really build an agile workflow where we're constantly responding to the needs of our consumers? Um, second, it's abstract. So, you know, we have this situation where cloud technology is changing rapidly. So today we might have a monolith. In the future, we might have a bunch of different microservices. We want to create an abstraction layer between the back end and the front end so that even as I, you know, even as we refactor from one back end technology to another, even as a lot of change happens there, because we've created this abstraction layer of the schema, we have freedom to move our back end around um, in a way you know, where we really kind of we really kind of decoupled the stuff that's available in the back end from the stuff that's available on the front end. So we can write new front ends, we can refactor our back ends without disturbing each other. So getting that abstraction layer in place. And you know, if you're super disciplined, can you create that with REST? Yeah. Is that usually the way it ends up? I would argue no. Um, and um, you know, third, declarative. So um, you know, I think the way that we think about REST APIs is often imperative. If I want to get a different set of data, I write a bunch of code saying how to get the data from point A to point B. GraphQL is a declarative approach. So we declare what our schemas are. We declare the data we want. Our query planner is a piece of software, not a human being. <laughs> and that means that because it's declarative, we have a much greater degree to analyze and understand what's happening. So if we want to make a security rule that says this data um, can only go these places, we can enforce that centrally because we have a vocabulary to talk about our data. We have a schema. Um, we have a query language. We can, we, can, we can say exactly who saw a particular medical record. Potentially in the future, we can even say, hey, you know, I want to I expand into EMEA. I need to cache my data there. Do I have to open a data center there and, and replicate you know, a big part of my infrastructure? Or can I just maybe have a directive that says, you know, <laughs> cache it in London? You know, we have... This, this idea of a declarative approach to APIs, where you say what you want, not how to do it, I think is going to be a rich vein for us in the same way that um, declarative query languages like SQL were a rich vein um, in the database world. So I think if you put it together, this idea of a agile, abstract, declarative way of thinking about APIs is the core of what's driving the rise of GraphQL. And I think that's most valuable at the edge of your data center. It's, so the question is, where do you put the abstraction layer, is my long-winded answer to your question. I think a lot of people are finding that it's good to put that abstraction layer, that agile, abstract, declarative abstraction layer, at the boundary between your data center and the consumers. So, um, you know, your first party apps, your partner apps, you know, it's really powerful to have an agile, abstract, and declarative way of looking at that. Inside your data center, you know, I, I think there's a thousand other use cases where that's not the thing that's most valuable. So I think whenever people are trying to add agility, wherever people are trying to get a better handle on, um, how their business processes are working, this declarative aspect. And wherever we see people um, looking for a better abstraction barrier, so I can change totally how my data center works without affecting any clients, that's, I think, where we're going to see um, continued traction for GraphQL. That's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So kind of using GraphQL as the abstraction layer where it really does be able to uh, speak to the needs of the individual consuming context. I think that really touches um, a little bit on what we had earlier heard today. So Vishaka was talking about um, uh, PayPal. GraphQL sped up the whole process. They could, you know, work really quickly. Uh, and then that became a problem of, well, then kind of the design of the schema. So it was like, it was really easy to throw in a couple of different fields and a couple of different features uh, that, they were trying to really avoid them because they did have an orchestrated series of graphs. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to avoid replicating those functionalities in different places so that there was still kind of a, a flexible approach. I think Roy also uh, hit on this as well. He said that, you know, APIs should be mapped to the customer needs. Would you say so with this data abstraction layer, and I, and I even throwing another another speaker so I met even had this question uh, was okay so then like who owns this data graph right what 
how would you say then, because you have this abstraction layer for all these different pieces and all these different teams, and it's, it's fundamentally a different shift, I would say, in how, how you think about your backends. What, what would you say is like a, a way to, to approach this, um, this data abstraction? How, do, how does that look like? Yeah, I think, um, so I think the question is like, great, we want to add an abstraction. Now, how do we do it? Uh, you know, it's been a dream that people have had for a long time. I remember, you know, even reading, um, I think Tim Berners-Lee's article in Scientific American in 2001 about the semantic web. So <laughs> this has been promised for a long time that we're going to have this universal abstraction. And I think that, you know, one of the key learnings around GraphQL is really start with the user in mind and be incremental. And uh, if you start with that, what we've seen is really some stunning results if you take an incremental agile approach to be able to map more and more of your data into a graph. So the trend that we typically see is it starts with a few individual use cases inside of a company where people find a really tangible and specific place that it solves an immediate problem. And I think one of the beauties of it is you don't need to go in there and draw your whole schema on a whiteboard. You don't need to um, you know, say, hey, we're going to go map our backend database schema exactly to this. You can start with what's a place where we wish had a little bit more flexibility? And you know, what's a you know, particular use case, product initiative, partner enablement initiative, you know, whatever it may be. Um, start with a tangible use case, get that into production. Once that's happened, um, I have almost never seen GraphQL be adopted. Once it gets into production, the value is so compelling that um, people see, okay, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Um, how do we get more of this in our organization? But uh, people also realize pretty quickly, you know, I use the metaphor of GraphQL as a dial tone instead of a buried cable. You don't want two dial tones inside your company. You don't, you don't want two phone books. <laughs> um, and so there really is a need to have a unification at some point in time of, how you, of your graph strategy across your company. So if, if you don't do this, what you'll see is you'll start to see these graphs popping up around your company, and you'll say, you know, we, it seems like we need to roll this up into something. What we see is that when that happens, it's not really that far of a leap technologically, organizationally, or in terms of politically, in terms of buy-in, to pick you know, often one of those groups, or maybe you've got an architecture practice is often where it sits, um, uh, that says, hey, you know, we have some proof points now of how this has worked for people. And this gives us a good platform to understand what's valuable and what the challenges are and start to plot out a larger graph strategy for our company. And that, and then the development that happens pretty naturally from this, and I've, I've seen this time and again, is you get someone whose job title is data graph champion. Uh, or, um, or maybe, and then that often expands to a team of data graph champions. And the, the transformation we see is, you know, sometimes these folks come from an API background, sometimes they come from a product background. Uh, it can be either, really. Um, but sort of the first challenge they tackle is, how do we just take these multiple graphs and merge them into one? And the good news is there's some good tooling there that can help you. There's an emerging set of best practices around that. You won't be the first that solved this problem and found a satisfying solution and wanted to expand once you, once you got it working. Um, but what we see also is kind of a, there's a transformation that happens where it goes from, hey, we want to solve these particular point problems about moving data around to asking, how can the data graph really be strategic? And I think this connects to, um, you know, people call this different things. I've heard uh, some enterprise Apollo users say um, the platform is the product. I've heard about the productization of APIs. And the key idea here is like, you know, I think what we're really doing is we've got all these amazing capabilities, all these amazing digital assets and services. And the question is, how do we really unlock that and make it like really valuable and useful for, um, for a uh, wider range of people? So some people are coming that from a, a wide, wide range of use cases, more agile inside our company, outside our company. Um, and the, um, some people come at that from an API background, but increasingly it's the product teams that also get in there because they're looking at product and they're thinking, I need to think beyond my first party app if I'm thinking about uh, what product is. I need to think about the graph itself as the product. So I think there's this coming together of these two forces, you know, the kind of the traditional API universe and the product universe. And, um, you know, it really is about creating a team that's thinking about your overall graph strategy. When we see how this plays out, what we see is a network effect inside of companies. Um, and I think the best way to do this is to have it truly be a partnership between the front end and the back end team, uh, have it truly be focused on the needs and the consumers, um, and have it be focused in a very agile way on saying, we're not going to get the schema perfect on day one. Instead, we're going to take advantage of the great tooling that exists around GraphQL and its declarative nature so that we can ship a new version every day if we need to. 
and have really good tools for managing the life cycle, deprecation, usage monitoring, and so on um, around the graph. When you do that and you really get close to your users of the graph, um, you just find that they have a they are an incredible source of information of how to continue to develop the graph. And you do end up with a set of best practices that are owned by the graph champion team. And the other thing you start to see is, you know, when this gets to a certain critical mass, it, it kind of gets a mind of its own where, not a mind of its own, but uh, a momentum, maybe would be a better thing to say. You find that there are backend teams that say, hey, I want to get my data on the graph because I've got an objective to get this amazing service I've got more widely used by the business. And if I get it into the graph, it'll be really easy for other teams inside my enterprise to consume it. So the more people are using the graph, the more people want to put stuff on the graph. The more people put stuff on the graph, the more people want to use the graph. And pretty soon, it's not just product developers that are using the graph either. You start to hear about marketing saying, hey, you know, it used to be if I wanted to build a cool marketing integration, I'd have to go blow a lot of political capital and like beg engineering to go build me this special REST API. But now I don't have to do that. I can, you know, go right into my GraphQL Explorer and I can browse all the dates available. I can get the complete business object, not just four fields. I can get it today, not in three months. I can get the exact live data that's showing up in the product. And that is a mind blowing experience for these functions outside of engineering. You know, we see marketing, we see sales, we see customer success. It's a mind blowing experience to be able to have that same access to data and services that the engineers did. So when that light bulb moment goes on, that's when the adoption of the data graph really starts to accelerate um, inside a company. And it, and it kind of goes beyond just this idea of we're enabling people to build apps faster tactically to this, hey, this has become a catalog, it's become a map. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, and it becomes part of the strategy. So my advice to everyone who's listening to this talk is, you know, if you want to ask, how can, how can I take my career to a, a more strategic level where I can, I can set more of, I can really create a, a whole other order of magnitude of business value? My question would be, ask how I can be part of growing that data graph inside of a company and unlocking not just the benefit for how we make app development easier, faster, enable our partners, but asking how we can transform our company strategy by like, you know, when, when we provide this abstraction layer, we just enable a lot more stuff acro across the business. And I think more and more VPs of engineering, more and more CIOs, more and more chief product officers actually are getting sophisticated about the, the benefit and the value that can bring. That's that's really interesting. So I would say that that is probably mimicking quite a bit what we've seen as well, even in just the CMS space. So Graph CMS is quirky in that we also support full mutations, which is kind of rare for a, a content management platform. And so we get a lot of people trying to model product on it, which is great. Like it's a fantastic use case that, you know, a lot of supporting read and write on the, the platform. And there is just this nature where the, the API design and the graph design of, of the content is now being owned by these product people that are trying to renovate this whole thing. I talked with a customer today who was, you know, it was dipped the toe in and then now they're going to put the whole entire application stack inside of graph CMS or in our tool, but, but like um, it's uh, inside of graph QL, the tool is agnostic, but like, it's it's really um, uh, contagious when you have this this mentality that you have this abstraction layer as a as a product. What you you touched on, and I want to kind of also try to loop in some of these questions we're getting here in the chat. Uh, what you touched yeah. on is interesting, though. So you you mentioned a little bit about this, uh, you know, other other business units wanting to get their services brought in to the graph. And then you also have the idea about sort of optimizing the graph for the product development. So one could even say that right off the bat that this data graph champion model potentially even has some multifaceted areas to specialize, those that are going to be more of the integration specialist of connecting the different services into the API and those that are then uh, refining the, the wrapping on it for the, the consumption. Or would you say that this is still potentially all encompassing a singular role? One of the questions I wanted to just kind of loop in, so, and I'm assuming that this ML abbreviation is referring to some sort of a machine learning model. Is that correct, Miguel? You can confirm, but if that's if that's the correct, uh, correct assumption, uh, you know, and maybe you've seen an example of this where there's a team that's doing data, yeah, doing, um, you know, machine learning kind of enriching their content or their their business logic or business data, 
uh, with machine learning, do you see that as being like something more specialized for the integration person or something more specialized for the well, let me touch on, let me start by touching on kind of how that graph champion team works and then I'll go into the ML question. I think that brings up something really interesting. Um, what we've seen is that um, the, you know, as, as you sort of move the clock forward and people kind of get this fully built, the, um, the graph champions often like help out more on a lower level in the beginning, getting the, getting the thing bootstrapped and helping a few teams like just get all the technology and the schemas lined up. But what starts to happen is you start to see them taking more of a facilitative role because really what's going on is GraphQL is about collaboration. I realize that's counterintuitive to a lot of people who think GraphQL is about reducing data on the wire, you know, um, you know all, all these technical benefits. But when you really start to scale GraphQL, GraphQL provides a language for talking about our data and how our use of it is changing. So I have a microservice, you have a microservice, we're referencing each other with a foreign key relationship. I wanna change my key. Okay, can we catch that in CI? Can I start a conversation with you? I wanna remove a field. And that field is used by a mobile app that we shipped, you know, six months ago uh, in Asia. <laughs> you know, is, there, is anyone aware of that app? Can we find those people? Can we talk with them? So GraphQL provides a language for talking about your data. And then that language provides a way to manage collaboration uh, as, the, um, as you use it more and more and more and more. So I think the best practice is to leave the product owners owning their queries and leave the um, service providers own, own what they're exposing and then create the, um, the workflows and the processes and the governance, um, you know, I, I think Miguel said, um, you know, the, that, that, that's really the responsibility that a fully mature organization falls on the graph champions to figure out how do we facilitate all that stuff to really unblock all those folks. Because the, the whole point here is really about empowering people. If you can empower backend teams to build services and more rapidly reach their users without having to go through this layer of custom code we have to write, and if we can empower um, back in teams also to have their services be discovered more frequently and know exactly who they're being used and by whom and how and how that's going to change tomorrow when the new release drops. And if we can able if we can empower product teams to browse all the dates available and pull anything they want out of that ocean and put it in a product and ship it tomorrow, you know, the, the, graph, the graph champions are the people who make sure all that empowerment is working the way it is. They shouldn't be the people that kind of take the scheme into their own hands. They should create the um, guidelines and the process so that that process works smoothly. Though they'll probably have to row the boat themselves a little bit in the beginning. And then on the, um, on the machine learning side, I guess I would say GraphQL, I mean, maybe in the future this will change, but I think GraphQL today is not about big data. GraphQL is about, I'd say, product data. So GraphQL isn't necessarily the technology that you wanna use if you're collecting you know, a billion events an hour and putting it into uh, like a data science pipeline. Um, GraphQL is what you use for what comes out of that pipeline. When you've got, okay, now I've got the product recommendations. I have this very valuable insight that's come out of all this analysis. Um, how do I distribute that into every, every channel? How do I get feature parity between iOS and Android about how our most potent uh, ML insights are being deployed at the point of consumption to affect our business? That's where really where we see today um, the intersection between uh, machine learning and data science and GraphQL is taking the, the valuable work product of that and pushing into every channel. Now, I think there's some other opportunities there. I think one opportunity is the way the graph is used is an incredible source of data. So three kinds of data we've got, we're talking about. There's the schema. That's a very valuable map of all of our data. Then there's the actual data I can get by querying the graph. I could do a GraphQL query. I get a response. Hey, it's all in my orders, all my customers, whatever. But then there's a third thing, which is the usage data, the analytics. So which clients are querying which objects? So from that, because you have this declarative um, uh, you know, because we have this declarative model um, or because you're, it's possible to do what we call structured logging, like you can understand exactly what API call was made and what response happened. It's actually possible to take the structured log of your graph and answer questions like, do people buy more ice cream on hot days? And that's something that people haven't really explored fully yet. But, you know, just imagine if the logs you got from your REST APIs were structured in such a way that you could understand exactly what was being done without having to read the code. You know, what, what does that open up in terms of inputs we can have to machine learning? The other thing is, I think we are gonna find, you know, part of the promise of GraphQL is your products or developers are gonna build products. And increasingly they'll want a schema to act, get at your data. The kind of the cool thing about the data graph is the byproduct of just empowering your product developers to build products better ends up being this amazing map of all your data that you get basically for free. So I think we're gonna see 
more and more use cases of that. Um, could we see a world where there's a GraphQL-like language or a GraphQL-like implementation that can really, you know, do the heavy list, do heavy listing like OLAP or other sorts of like just much more data intensive, you know, structures? You know, that's not, I think, the most commonly deployed use case today, but I think there's an interesting possibility there because, you know, we don't want to get too far out, out there, right? You know, we don't want to say GraphQL is going to solve every problem, but I've got to think that if we have a better language for talking about our data, um, that's going to help some of the other data governance and schema problems that we're seeing in the enterprise is just data proliferates everywhere. What's the exact role GraphQL is going to play? I, I don't think we know yet. Yeah, yeah, quite interesting. I've I've personally used it and have seen it being used for data visual, uh, visualization more and more because yeah. in that case, you are able to pare down the, the load that yeah. you're trying to process. And that, that's a very valid it's, case. It's um, huge for BI. It's, it's huge yeah, for rapidly yeah. slicing and dicing the data you've gotten and, and running reports against it. So there, there's almost like a secondary abstraction between the, so there's the abstraction of all your data, then the abstraction between your, your log data, basically, and your, your uh, data yeah. lake. So um, I'd say, go, don't go crazy. <laughs> Just get the graph in there. There's a pretty good playbook now. Get, get some use cases into production. It's really simple. It's really easy if you do it right. And then you know, start asking how do we get more people on the graph and just bring that back toward the data graph champions and empowering those teams to build their parts of the graph while keeping it on the rails. If you do that, you're going to have this strong platform. People are naturally going to have a, a, a thousand ideas of what will yeah. come next once you've got that. And then you just have to be careful about which of those ideas you tackle, which order. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, that's classic product development, right? This is exactly the problem that every product developer has is having to to process feature requests, in this case, integration service layer. I think that, I think it actually uh, really cleanly even brings in the first talk we had of the day from Mark Andre, where he was talking about, um, you know, start small, have a, a concrete example of which service you're trying to model or which, which, you know, client you're trying to support as your starting point, support that. And then you can scale because it's not about versioning the APIs in the classic sense. It's not about having to, ship out massive changes you can really build on an in-production api very easily so i think that makes a lot of sense i mean the the fact is all day we've heard people talking a lot about this concept of data this data graph essentially over and over people are talking about multiple services coming together coming pulling this together and i think i think titling it as you know the data graph and the data graph champion as being the person that sort of uh, conceptually puts puts it all together makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm thinking so if it, for a skeptic who's still kind of thinking, well, it's kind of kind of a nice way to describe it. From from your perspective as a, as a company, I mean, because this is what you guys do, this is your bread and butter. Um, what would you say? Do you have any any more concrete examples or anything that would be from your experience more support to really uh, back up or say that this data graph is a thing that this is really a, a pattern that should be followed. Do you have any kind of? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think what we're seeing is the emergence of a new product category. So, databases, relational databases, were a new thing in the early '80s and uh, late '70s, early '80s. Um, so, SQL was a new idea. You know, as people are saying, hey, this, this way we're doing things where we write COBOL or we write RPG every time we need to get at our data because we have to get it out of this file and this file and this file on this new mini computer we bought. People saw that that approach of having your, having your query planner be a human being instead of a piece of software. People saw that that wasn't going to work. That drove the interest in SQL, which I think was originally was a, a paper by IBM Research, I think. And... Um, you need the you need an implementation of that um, of that language, and you know so there are various GraphQL tools out there. Apollo is like one I think pretty complete vision of how you can build a data graph, kind of analogous to how like Postgres or MySQL or um, you know Oracle would be an example of a implementation of a relational database. But I guess I would just say if if you go back and and look and um, you know, there's a lot of interesting parallels where people needed to move to a more declarative way of doing things, and um, you know just a lot of things we take for granted now, like the understanding that databases should be um, they should be highly available, they should be scalable, they should have an expressive query language, they should be distributed across multiple availability zones. You know, all those questions, the, those are things that people are first starting to ask and figure out maybe around that time period as relational databases became a thing that people recognized. And now, you know, we have a whole explosion of these 
these um, different databases. We have NoSQL databases, we have column store databases, so many different kinds of specialization. But there was a time when all this was new. That's the time that we're experiencing right now with the data graph. It's the beginning of a new category, like the birth of the relational database. The winning query language has become pretty clear, just like it became pretty clear that SQL is probably the right language for relational databases. It's become pretty clear that GraphQL is the right language for the data graph. And um, I think that brings us to a point where we're all sort of asking, What's the right timing for this for us? We can see the benefits. We can see the people that have kind of gone ahead. Um, and what do we have to put in place uh, to support that? And what are the best practices that um, are going to work for that? So I think that you know the way to really substantiate the fact that we have a category here is to ask how many people have been successful with this. And you know the answer is a growing number of enterprises really have rolled this out at scale. And you know there's some case studies on our website if you if you want to hear some of the stories. We've been trying to collect all these awesome stories about enterprise scale GraphQL on our website. But I think an even better sort of proof point of the maturity is we start, we're starting to have a pretty clear read on what the best practices of a data graph are. So we have a website, um, principledgraphql.com, is written by my co-founder Matt and I, where we lay out what we have seen the best practices for GraphQL to be. And this is based on working with a, you know, a lot of the world's largest GraphQL users, whether I mean large in terms of query volume, large in terms of number of developers like so for example at Expedia they use GraphQL across I think like you know there's like there's, there's 30 plus brands I think in the Expedia group portfolio and they they have a awesome data graph champion team that is building that graph across the entire sort of Expedia portfolio um, you know uh, we've seen or even scale in terms of complexity like um, in terms of like the number of different backend services the number of mainframes the number of different heterogeneous data sources been integrated you know We've now seen enough game footage, I think, on how that plays out that, you know, we can with, um, you know, we're not, we're not geniuses. We just try to listen, and then we try to, like, write down what we heard and share it with other people. And so if you go to principledgraphql.com, you'll see what we've been able to distill. Ten principles here. We divide them into integrity principles, agility principles, and operations principles. And integrity principles are things like you probably want one graph, one dial tone. But you probably don't want a monolithic implementation. <laughs> you probably want a way that different groups can work together. You probably want a scheme. You probably want a server that your scheme is on. You know, if you use Git but you didn't have a server, <laughs> you know, Git supports that. You can just keep your you can keep your code on a laptop, but it turns out to be a really good idea to keep all your source code on a central server. It turns out to be a really good idea to you know have workflows and integrations around that to manage your source code. Uh, the same is true with GraphQL. So you want to have one graph with a federated implementation. You want to track that scheme in a registry. It, it's principledgraphql.com. Here I'll I'll drop it in the chat here. Um, I'll, I'll type it in. You can um, keep going. There you go. Um, and then likewise, you want, it, you want the schema to be demand-oriented, you know, structured around the user. So you want it to be agile. Um, it should be abstract, shouldn't be coupled to the backend implementation. Um, you want to have good tooling so you can monitor improved performance. Um, you want to use the metadata about the graph to empower developers. So for example, like, you know, if you use the Apollo stack, like right there in VS Code, as you're typing a query, you can be seeing predicted query latency based on actual analytics of like the queries have been running on your production server for the last 24 hours. You can see, um, you know, you can see field deprecations inside CI. You can have this incredible feedback loop. So that metadata is really powerful. And then finally, we increasingly know the best practices for operating a graph around access demand control, how to maintain that structured log both for performance mon monitoring and management, and also for how to, um, you know, get the data that I mentioned out of the meta, the value of the mentioned that I mentioned the value out of the metadata that I mentioned before. And also there's a better and better understanding of, you know, just how to, what the right coupling or lack thereof is between the backend services and GraphQL and kind of down to the level of particular process, how you deploy this. So my point is just, you know, uh, we published this, I think a bit over a year ago, more than that now, I guess. Um, yeah, it's, time flies. Um, we, um, you know, this was a distillation of the conversations we'd had with some of the most sophisticated users, most high scale users and all those aspects I mentioned. Now we have a lot of confidence in this. This has really stood the test of time. And, um, you know, if you, if you go from this, you're going to find that there are, uh, you need some tooling around this. Like you want to keep your scheme on a server, you, you know, using Git's great, but you also want to use, I mean, take your pick, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. You want, you want a source of truth. You want the great developer tools plugged into it. You want to have the workflows like pull requests. You want to have the integrations with CI. Um, that gets really powerful through scale your graph. So, you know, I guess shameless plug from Apollo, we've got that for you. And again, we're not geniuses. <laughs> we just talked to the people that have been building it 
uh, at scale in the enterprise and said, hey, you know, it looks like each of you have a 50% implementation of this really cool thing. <laughs> and each of you have a different 50%. So can we learn from the infrastructure you want when you, know, you really build best practices for GraphQL in the, in the enterprise? Um, and can we um, you know, turn that into something that not only scales to the world's largest sites and has all kind of the stuff that you'd, you'd want to roll this out, um, but also scales down to small teams. So, you know, I guess, um, you know, to me, the best argument for the data graph is we can write down what the best practices are. We can see people that are adopting the same thing the same ways. So we can see they're getting the same benefits. Um, and, you know, the point that, you know, we've been able to sort of collate all that into, you know, I think the functionality that you'd want to have to build a graph. And I guess as far as Apollo, you know, if you want to build that all yourself, you know, well, we'll try to talk you out of it, but <laughs> we're also happy to help you map out the challenges that are ahead based on our experience. You know, we just love hearing about how people use GraphQL, use Apollo, and we love being a resource for the community. I think the reason where we are what we are is because we've, where we are is because we've tried to help. And I think, you know, that's resulted in people supporting us and we want to, you know, <laughs> continue that and tell, you know, for as long as the company exists. So even if it's just about helping each other, we'd love, we'd love to share what we've learned about best practices. And you know, at the same time, if you take a look and say, hey, maybe an off-the-shelf solution for our, you know, graph catalog and all of our tooling, um, you know, would be a, a good choice for us. Um, you know, you can, you can get a version of it for free, you know, sign up today. <laughs> There's a version, you know, it's pretty inexpensive. You can buy with a credit card. And, you know, if you're ready to ask, how do I combine several different teams, graphs at the enterprise and start booting up my graph champion team? You know, that's something we can help you with in a pretty 360-degree way uh, uh, as, as we have others. And you know, to our mutual benefit is we learn from you as well. Yeah, I think, and uh, I again, I want to just um, not not plug Apollo, <laughs> but basically to say, I mean, it, it really is do offer the the full uh, the full service, and it is a, a really sometimes you need to just find that battle tested tool that uh, or tools that uh, help you get up and running and. Um, and I've been using your your software, the the open source stuff, uh, for for a long time for for my demos and things because it is just really really good. Um, and so definitely encourage anybody who's looking at doing that. I want to I do want to be really jealous here to save some time for questions for the audience. Um, I wanted to to look back. So one person mentioned an interesting question. I, it's an interesting GraphQL ish. I think base level question too. Um, so are you seeing strong use cases involving event-driven architecture, Kafka, Pulsar, etc.? So Apollo is, you've got some some subscription support. Right? Subscription is not, not a standardized part of the specification yet. It's still being refined. And you guys have kind of gone all in and said, well, we're going to embrace this architecture, right? Or do I understand that incorrectly? Yeah. Or? Yeah, subscriptions is in the core language. You know, there's a there's a subscription keyword. There's a well-structured concept about subscriptions, uh, and I think um, you know that's that's like um, we're seeing more and more usage of subscriptions. I would say, especially uh, in the enterprise, um, the there's a good way of understanding how to do it in GraphQL, and um, you know I think the tooling is not as far along as it is. Uh, for kind of the re request response piece of it, but it's definitely there. You'll just have to do a little bit more wiring it up. And, you know, some of the built-in Apollo stuff that, you know, will give you like incredible Superman x-ray vision and what's happening with some parts of your, you know, um, wow, well, I deep my camera by <laughs> reaching out there. You know, you'll, you have a little bit less visibility into every single thing you might possibly want about subscriptions, but we are seeing more and more use in us to think about um, should we prioritize even just giving it really that 360 degree tooling treatment but yeah I mean it um, it is absolutely um, you know absolutely works people get a lot of value out of it and we're seeing more and more of it if we look down the future a little bit farther I think um, one really cool thing is there's the idea of the at live directive so that is if subscriptions are a um, you know event driven paradigm at live is sort of the declarative version of data synchronization where hey you know don't make me query for changes, just keep me up to date. <laughs> GraphQL, do the work. <laughs> um, and that one's a little bit, that's probably, the, that may be the thing you're thinking about that's a little bit farther off. You know, back in the day, um, you know, Meteor JS was a pioneer of live queries. So we know how complicated that is. And we know that giving people live query functionality that is too magical on the inside, where when you need to scale it to, you know, a billion requests an hour, you don't know how to do it. Like that's that's not the 
you know, right path for an enterprise scale technology like GraphQL. So we are, um, you know, our motto is by the community for the community. We want to stay right there, maybe like, you know, we want to stay maybe half a step ahead of wherever the wave is with GraphQL. So we're always building against very concrete use cases. So we have that for subscriptions. And I think that over the coming years, we're going to see more and more powerful declarative functionality that's event driven as well. I think that would also probably uh, loop into the question from Raul as well, who questioned what's uh, what's the argument to use GraphQL that is happening mostly on the back end, for example, payment processing. I think uh, payment processing as exposed as part of a data graph becomes really powerful. I don't know if sp strictly speaking GraphQL in the payment processing world makes the most amount of sense. I suppose authenticated fields in the GDPR scope there could be some benefits there where you can auth you can auth fields and say this is not allowed to be accessed in a in an unsecure way, but um, exposed and then the scripts, subscription about a payment being processed is a natural fit. Um, and uh, you know, you could imagine that. Yeah. Or do you have an additional thought there? Yeah, I think my thought is um, let's talk about what we mean by, what we mean by backend. If we mean service to service, like in terms of inside of our inside of a single rack of servers as part of a service mesh, that's where I think GraphQL's value proposition isn't as strong. Some people use it there, but to me, you know, you don't necessarily want agile, abstract, and declarative. <laughs> you want like you know, trusted, <laughs> coupled, <laughs> slow changing, <laughs> concrete, you know, inside your service mesh. But I want to distinguish that from when it's back into the back end. I think the strong case for GraphQL and the data graph and for agile, abstract, and declarative is when we're talking outside of our organization. We're either talking to someone's iPhone, which is outside of our organization, kind of by definition, or we're talking to a partner. Because you want to put that right abstraction barrier. You want to put that right agility. You want to put that right you know, declarative flexibility and introspection whenever my organization is talking to your organization. So to me, if we're talking about a payment processing use case where I'm making a payment process, processing API available to someone, or I'm using someone else's payment processing API, even if no user's involved, even if servers, even if server to server, I think the use case is every bit as strong. And you know, I think it's interesting because, what was I gonna say? You know, inside of our organization, think about how much work we have to do when an API producer, and API consumer work together. Like I'm, I'm a product developer, I need to access these backend services, or I'm team A and I need to access the services of team B. You know, we do a lot of work to stay coordinated. What happens when those people aren't in the same building? What happens when those people don't work at the same company? What happens when those people have totally different objectives this quarter? <laughs> Guess what? You need it even more, you know? So every reason that makes us want an agile, abstract, declarative way for us to build our first party apps or our first party services just gets magnified a thousand times when you're working outside of your company. So I think it's really valuable there. Um, and it's, it's an area of active development, right? What's the best way to build product? Um, what's the best tooling to support public APIs around GraphQL? Very active and fertile area of investigation right now. And that's time. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. One other yes. thing out there really fast. Yeah. We yeah. just shipped something amazing. You should all check out, totally free. Um, it's called Apollo Explorer. And um, if you like GraphQL Playground, if you like graphical, this is an incredibly upgraded version on this. This is like, you know, we spent six months interviewing a ton of people asking both when you're just getting started and also in scale in the enterprise when you have a huge schema. <laughs> you can't even keep track of all those objects and all those people. How do you navigate that? How do you build queries? How do you save queries? We heard an amazing story. You know, we hear, we hear about people who they keep a browser window open with 50 tabs just because they don't want to lose their GraphQL queries. <laughs> so. We, we've, you know, we've tried to do a graph querying experience right, uh, and it's, uh, it's just built into Apollo Studio, um, you know, our, our core suite. So if, if you just go to apollographql.com and, and sign up, um, it'll, it'll dump you right into Studio. Actually, um, I, can, I can share the uh, launch blog post too, I guess, uh, point you at it. Um, I just wanted to put that in there because I, I think it's really cool. And um, here, I'll show, the, I'll show the link right here. And uh, I'd love for you to all check it out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool. So uh, definitely double plug on that. Um, we got to all head over to the closing keynote. Uh, Jeff, this was fantastic. I really appreciate you coming in and uh, having this chat. A lot of great resources in there. Do go check out Apollo. Follow Jeff. Uh, it's Jeff uh, QL. Jeff QL. Yeah, G -E -O -F -F -Q -L. Jeff QL. He's all in. He's all in, people. I'm all in. Um, I sure am. Yeah. I'm a true believer. 
<laughs> Fantastic stuff. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again. And uh, it was really uh, an honor to be able to, to interview today. So uh, awesome. Jesse, well, this is really fun. Yeah. Anytime. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bye. See you folks.